Brown. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint on the show this week. John Cameron, and uh, who is a, a development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation and uh, Casey Ashford, a law clerk at the PLF. Um, poor neighborhoods uh, are hit the hardest by asset forfeiture in Chicago. Fancy that. This is a study done by Lucy Parson Labs, which is a, a Chicago nonprofit. It shows that uh, the south side of Chicago and the west side of Chicago, black neighborhoods, are actually hit by far the worst by asset forfeiture. Why would that be, John? I'm the faintest. I no, the <laughs> it, when you think about it, it makes sense. Um, asset forfeiture really preys upon a lack of knowledge and a lack of representation. Uh, if you look at what kind of assets are seized, and in, in, uh, they are they are. Um, buildings where so-called drug activity takes place, uh, cash, um, cash receipts from restaurants, or according to the cops, cash receipts from possible drug sales, um, uh, goods typically rather than services. You know, it's it's hard to see services, but but actual physical things. So if you look at um, the poorest neighborhoods. Typically, they would be places where drug activity might take place in a building, so the building is seized. They'd be places where uh, people's um, where people transact a lot in cash because they don't have bank accounts, um, choose not to have bank accounts for a reason or other, or can't have bank accounts. Um, there's a um, so this makes absolute sense. Well, it also makes sense from the, from the standpoint that if you're poor, you can't fight back. It costs a lot of money to fight back. If, so, if somebody, if the cops take your stuff, you know, you're pulled over for a, a broken tail light. Absolutely. And they, and they take yeah. your hundred dollars. It's going to cost you five hundred dollars in legal fees to get your hundred dollars back. So you're not going to do it. And they actually did a, a subset of the uh, uh, assets that were seized. And if it was less than one hundred dollar value. We're talking about 34, 34 cent money orders. Yeah. We're talking about CDs. We're talking about uh, uh, you know costume jewelry. We're talking about really, really inexpensive stuff. That even had a greater disparity of being taken from poor neighborhoods as opposed to uh, more affluent neighborhoods. Usually, cops uh, shake people down for more expensive stuff. I'm they not quite they don't shake them down for. I mean, if you can get a hundred percent with no with no. If you can take somebody's hundred dollar bill and not worry about them going to court to mm -hmm. try to get it back, mm -hmm. that's a hundred percent profit, yeah. or uh, you know, totally, totally uh, uh, repercussion free swag yeah. for the police department compared to, uh, you know, a ten thousand dollar, you know, uh, taking the from, speed from, boat from, you from, run into, from you Juliet, run into which, might, which yeah. might get yeah. might get contested down the line, and you have yeah. to actually, you know, uh, defend while you while you took it, maybe even give it back. Well, giving it back, yeah. So the the absolutely uh, the you're in a neighborhood where where even even the the lawyers that represent the poor they're busy representing the poor to to help them keep their children or keep their house because they're behind in their mortgage or uh, keep from going to prison for a crime that is victimless if it wasn't for the law. So uh, they're probably not throwing a whole lot of assets at somebody who's carrying $500 in cash, and the cop shook him down and said, this is obviously drug money, I'm taking it. So they, they, it makes absolute sense that this is happening. But um, this type of, uh, what would I call it, extortion, well, typically it's, it's theft. also... It's, it's theft. Yeah, I mean, yeah, more yeah. money is taken by cops in civil asset forfeiture on a given, any given year than is taken by burglaries and robberies, by, by, by you know, amateur crooks. So the professional crooks actually do much better than the amateurs, is what you're saying. The, well, uh, I, the, the crooks that operate on the cover, cover of the I, I want to stick up a little bit for police officers for whom I have a great deal of respect and just say that, you know, we want to make laws that put incentives in the right place. So human nature is going to be the same. We just want to create good incentives for people to do the right thing. So really, it's the policymakers who allow things like civil asset forfeiture to take place that I think we should be questioning. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's the people who, it's the city councils and the state legislatures and the federal government who enact civil asset forfeiture that allow 
that sort of highway robbery to take place in the first place. And yeah, without, I, without the permissive law, he wouldn't have That's it. right. So I think we should look to them to create change rather than just blame. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it back at, um, since it, at this point in my life, I'll never run for public office. I'm uh, going to um, disagree a little bit and push back because whenever sure. the legislatures and the governments try to... Um, I think bow to an awful lot of public pressure about civil asset forfeiture, they're pushed back by police departments. And one of the reasons for that is that they fund an awful lot of stuff out of the money, the free money they get from asset forfeiture. Also, that the, the assets they seize aren't typically tracked as well through their accounting systems and as well cared for as uh, their normal hard budget that they have to get approved and double checked and all the rest of that. So, you know, the, the problem is, is that maybe it's a, a, a meeting halfway, but now police departments have come to depend on this money. And it's really hard once you depend on it uh, to do without it. So whenever legislatures, not always, but usually whenever legislatures push the cops and say, we need to end this because it's bad policy and it, it, it really targets the poor and the people can least afford to be targeted. Um, they're saying, well, how are we going to get our, our tank or, or our SWAT team? <laughs> you know, we need to get that money somewhere. Yeah, you're, you're right. The, our hostage the, negotiator. The, uh, the cop shops are the that? biggest lobbyists for uh, maintaining and, uh, and even making making asset forfeiture. But again, it's rational even, self. Even more it's rational self. It, yeah, it's, it's yeah. still, yes. Don't it's attack the sinner. Uh, attack the sin. Well, the, yeah, attack the sinner too. Yeah. I mean, the cops are, are complicit. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely complicit. But it's but the ultimate it's responsibility. It's the structural incentives the in ultimate, place. Yeah, the ultimate responsibility lies with the people you and I vote for. That's right. So don't vote for any politician that, uh, like Trump, that says asset forfeiture is a good, is a good thing. I... Um, I don't think I'll vote for him. Okay, good. You know uh, Lashika White is the mother of good uh, Ed, or Edmund White. And, Edmund. Uh, Edmund wanted to go to you know wanted to continue going to his uh, elementary uh, science-based elementary uh, charter school and uh, couldn't do it. How come? So here we have these antiquated laws on the books from the 1970s that were geared at increasing diversity, but have now come to have actually the exact opposite effect. So Edmund and his family uh, lived in a downtown area and were going downtown. to move out um, into St. the Louis. suburbs St. Yeah, Louis. of St. Louis. And, okay. the and he attended Gateway Science Academy, St. which St. is actually... St. Louis? Yes, yes yeah. St. Louis. Gateway Science Academy, uh, that was a magnet school. And so his family was very happy with that school, but they wanted to move to a different neighborhood. And now, since he moved out of the inner city area, he actually can't go back to that same school which is overwhelmingly white because of his race of being African American. He just so, moved across the county line, right? Or that's city, right. Something as simple as that. And if he was uh, a different race, then he would be able to attend the school. So it's now 2017, and we have this young, bright third grader who wants to continue going to his STEM magnet school, but is prohibited by doing so because of his race. What's the, how is the court uh, here? How is the court taking that the, the argument? Are they looking at the at the uh, legalities, or are they looking at the the, the result of the uh, of the the bad effects of the law? So I think if they were looking at the bad effects of the law, they would have had to have sided with the Pacific Legal Foundation from the outset. But actually, the lower court uh, ruled against Edmund and Pacific Legal Foundation initially. So it is um, up for appeal right now. And the uh, prognosis. Uh, so we we haven't heard yet. Uh, so we're awaiting a ruling, but the Pacific Legal Foundation uh, would follow this case all the way up to the Supreme Court if an adverse ruling came down, because it is just uh, incredibly so, mind blowing that. So is that the U.S. Court of Appeal now? That's right. And and uh, if, waiting on an Eighth Circuit decision. No. Okay. Now, if uh, uh, if the depending on which way the ruling goes, it will be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, if it's a favorable ruling, then it wouldn't. But if the Eighth Circuit rules against Edmund and Pacific Legal Foundation, then it would most likely go up to, or at least PLF would appeal to the Supreme Court. Right. Would, would the uh, school district appeal, uh, or whoever is defending, would they appeal if it, if it goes against them? I don't know. It's actually, know it's actually a, um, 
it's not the school district. It's a kind of oh, an independently the, created yeah. uh, quasi-government agent, agency that yeah. is designed to implement these 1970s archaic rules. Desegregation rules. Desegregation rules. So the the St. Louis yeah. transfer program yeah. is what it is. Yeah. So that's that's the 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 people carrying the case. What's what's especially galling in this, and I don't know who said it. The way you end, it was one of the current Supreme Court justices, I think, um, said the way you end segregation is by ending segregation. So every time, and and constantly court court decisions at the higher courts say that. Segregation, favoritism, quotas, anything like that is is bad and wrong and leads to ill effects throughout you know, the, the people um, that you most want to serve. Yet government agencies constantly really kind of just ignore these Supreme Court decisions and keep doing it. They did it in Texas and the university there. Um, they've, they've done it all over the country. So the, the the current purveyors of segregation aren't uh, evil slum lords trying to keep black folks out, or or people having rigorous standards and trying to keep students out. They're they're governments. They're government agencies and quasi government agencies who, under the guise of of trying to protect people, are, are recreating the very thing that they're railing against. And that what that's what makes it so galling. The other thing that's terrible about this is that the magnet school is primarily white, even though it's in downtown St. Louis, because it is such a good school and has such rigorous standards. So by allowing Edmund to transfer, they would actually be accomplishing what the stated principle of the whole program is. So it's ludicrous. That's right. Their goal is to remove barriers to educational success and increase diversity. Michael Schellenberger of the of Environmental Progress says, only nuclear can lift all humans out of poverty while saving the natural uh, environment. That doesn't sound like a your your standard variety uh, uh, green. John, what's going on? Well, I think there's a little history lesson here before we talk about it. Ralph Nader, originally the Greens were were very very favorable on nuclear because they understood that it would have the, the least harmful effect uh, on the environment. It's all about energy density. You know, we have all this great talk about solar and how solar is getting cheaper and it's getting better and all the rest of that. But if you look at the, the amount of fuel, the size of the plant needed, and, and um, the ability to produce massive amounts of energy without harming the environment, despite all the wild stories, nuclear power hands down um, is the best option. As a matter of fact, in the 50s, Eisenhower and many of the leaders of uh, the um, industrialized West uh, looked at the horrible poverty there was in third world countries and, and flat out said that nuclear power, uh, we will use nuclear power for peaceful means to lift those people out of poverty. And if nuclear programs, um, what has happened is that the, the stated means or the stated goal of the Greens is now being um, shown to not be their real goal. Uh, many of the many of the Russonian uh, utopian type Greens, what they don't want, they don't want uh, poor people to get better. They want poor people to disappear. They want humans to go away and they want the population of the planet to be lower. And if you have free or virtually free power, which is what nuclear power unfettered could provide, then you would have more goods and services, more homes, more cars, more TVs, more of the horrible things that the Greens actually hate. Because they're people haters, not plant lovers. And so the, their real true colors are being exposed by their opposition to nuclear. And um, all of these horrible nuclear accidents that you're nuclear, if we pronounce it like former President Bush, <laughs> all these horrible nuclear accidents that they talk about, even Chernobyl, which is by far the worst thing that's ever happened, a handful of people got killed, 4,000 people uh, or so were affected by radiation sickness, probably 12,000 people will have some form of cancer as a result of it. And uh, if you look at 
coal fired, oil fired, all the rest of that stuff. Uh, increase in 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 milligan pollution in China. You could easily say that three or four million people a year die from carbon-based fuel. If you look at what's happening, the rape of the earth uh, that's going on uh, to provide um, the the uh, very rare earths that are needed for all of the solar and all the other things we're doing, uh, you could probably make that same kind of number. But the, the real number, even under the most horrible, like at uh, Three Mile Island meltdown, um, the, the uh, one person was exposed to radiation the equivalent of one-sixth of an x-ray. So you'll, you'll see the real green come through here. And the green is red, and the green is a people hater. And that's why nuclear power is never going to get uh, off the ground. Because it will do... Oh, it's off the ground. It's well, not off the it's, ground getting, in this it's getting buried. I mean, and it's it's ninety percent or something like that of the power in France. It's well, a huge percentage of the power in in uh, China uh, and, and India and, and other. And, and in and in France, they're going backwards, and in the rest of the world, they're going backwards. I don't know about the, France. They're going yeah, backwards no, in Germany. I'm not sure. They are France. going backwards in France as well. Okay. Yeah, because the the real the real reason um, that that they despise nuclear power is not the harm it will do to the planet. Uh, it's a good nuclear, thing it will do for, for it's people. It's a good thing it will do for people. And, you know, there are, you can talk about uh, old style uh, nuclear power. This guy, uh, if, you, if you'll if uh, you Google or whatever service you use, Michael Schellenberger, he um, talks about a, another gentleman, I forget his name, I didn't write it down, who's done a wonderful study that goes through the history of it. The Green Movement at first was just head over heels in love with um, nuclear power because they knew that. Um, it could save the environment they love. And people who are humanists were in love with it because they knew that even the primitive nuclear power they had in the 50s uh, you know, is virtually free compared to other things once those plants are in place. But uh, so many barriers have been put in place to, to nuclear and it's been the, the cause celebre for the, for, the, for the liberals for years. Uh, wonderful power plants have been shut down, and it's cost lives. It costs lives, it costs jobs, it costs all the rest of that. And they don't care, quite frankly, because what they want to see is not human progress, but human regress. Oh, that was a little pessimistic, John. Well, it... <laughs> um, I mean, you look don't at think th human entrepreneurship and ingenuity will will carry the day for more efficient and clean energy? Well, one would hope, but uh, you're, you're facing I, I would, an I would, awful yeah, I mean, you, you are battle. right about the motivation of yeah. uh, yeah. a certain percentage, not all, but a certain percentage of the Green Movement. Uh, but there is also, it's a, it's a big world, and I guarantee you China's building all kinds of nukes. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that uh, other third world countries, India, for instance. Oh, India, India is a, a bright spot in some ways. I mean, it's a mess in others. Yeah, but, but uh, my, my point is yeah. other countries are going to go full bore nuke, and they're going to do well. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, they'll probably uh, outshine the United States and uh, Western Europe economically within a very short order, simply because they're willing to do what's necessary to make economic progress happen and do it in a smart way, and nuclear is a smart way to make economic progress uh, take place. No, I, I absolutely agree with what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. I happen to live in this country, and so I'm talking about you know, this country. I'm, I well, don't have the thing about yeah. the thing about economic uh, competition yeah. is that it may, it may you know, be well beyond your lifetime. In my lifetime, but at especially some point, yours, because you're older than me. At some point, the uh, not the, hers, man. <laughs> at some at some point, even the uh, even the uh, the slowest of countries will figure out that it, you know we need to you know compete with the rest of the world. Well, let, let's let's talk about the positive. Then. Let me flip the switch and go to Mr. <laughs> positive, because that's usually who? who I am, Mr. Positive. Oh, okay. So let's let's talk about the world if this were to happen. Um, if you look at any equation, uh, you have good services, you have human capital, you have all the rest of that, and you need energy for almost everything. Imagine a world in which in, in energy is basically free. So that frees you up to look at everything you do in a completely different way. So we have water problems in the state of California. Why? I won't go into that. That's a three-hour show right there. But um, mostly politics. But yeah, go mostly on. politics. So you have this big fat thing called the ocean out there. You know there are problems with uh, desalinization. Uh, it's very expensive. 
um, with, with unlimited power. You could do it in a way that would even satisfy the environmentalists. You look at industrial processes that are a balance of the expense of power versus uh, the use of human capital and goods and services. If you have unlimited power, then that equation changes. You look at um, pumping water, you look at transportation, you look at uh, decentralizing the grid with nuclear power plants that they have designed. And if we didn't have this massive push against them, you'd have something the size of a, of a uh, container ship cargo, bury it in your neighborhood, it's a completely sealed unit, lasts for 30 years, you plug it into the local grid, you don't have to worry about a massive power plant failure, and you provide all the energy that a thousand homes need. Nuke in your backyard. I nuke your, <laughs> and, and bury it in my backyard, I volunteer right now, I won't even make you pay me for it. So imagine <laughs> what would happen if our grid, instead of being this massive power lines that crisscross the country from these huge power plants that are stuck in one place, you could have a town of 10,000, say, put it right there, and it would have all the power it needs. So the technology exists or is right around the corner to really turn the earth into the utopia it should be based upon what you're talking about, the entrepreneurial spirit and scientific advancement. So that's the positive, and I'm going to leave it there. Murr versus Wisconsin. That's a good place to leave it. Murr versus Wisconsin. I uh, argued in front of the U.S. Supreme Court earlier this year. What's, uh, what's the prognosis there? So the, so the Pacific Legal Foundation is awaiting a decision on the Murr case any day now. And so what happened in this case is that you have uh, William and Dorothy Murr who bought two beautiful uh, lots on a river. Originally, they had just bought one to build a small family cabin that their family could come out there and enjoy uh, beautiful nature. Uh, and then they liked it so much and they saw that more folks were moving into the area, they made the smart investment decision to go ahead and buy the lot right next to theirs. So 40 years go by and now their uh, children and grandchildren are enjoying the same lot and they saw that they made a good investment and they were ready to sell that second lot. But they were not allowed to do that because the government considered it to be one lot while, mind you, at the same time, and this is what really gets me, is that they had been paying taxes on both lots separately this whole time, and yet they can't sell it as two separate lots. Two so, lots magically <laughs> become one lot. So uh, we hope for a favorable verdict from the Supreme Court soon so that there could be a precedent uh, for thousands of property right, or property owners whom the, who are affected by this issue. The, then, and John Groen did a marvelous job trying to get the court to pay attention to the central issue of relevant parcel. And the, the court, if you, you can listen to these arguments, uh, folks at home, on, uh, is it oye.com? And, uh, and some other websites, you can actually listen. Pacific Legal Foundation yeah. uh, you can, org. You yeah. Start there before you make your way over to other sites. Yeah, actually, I should have probably <laughs> mentioned since I work there, or did <laughs> until before the show started, uh, go to Pacific Legal Foundation first, Pacific, Pacific Legal Foundation, or pacificlegal.org is a website, and you can hear it there. And um, what I would suggest doing if you want to hear um, human communication at its very finest is to listen to some of the wonderful lawyers from Pacific Legal Foundation argue these cases in front of the Supreme Court. I have heard um, one of them uh, described, and he's, he's up for a federal judgeship, uh, and he should get it, as uh, his ability to communicate in front of the Supreme Court as an Olympic athlete in the finals of, of an Olympic event. And I'd say that's true. It's, it can be, even for folks who are not fans of the law or legality and think it's dry and boring, if you want to see um, human communication at its peak and its best, I'd suggest listening to some of and these And Damien, Damien Schiff was nominated to the uh, Federal Court of Claims. And, Court of Claims, yeah. Right. And yeah. his hearing was this, this, this past his week, His right? hearing was... On Wednesday. On Wednesday. What yeah. was yesterday well, we, morning? We, we, we wish him well. Yes. We sure uh, do. Dr. Yeah. Lee Burchanks, I hope I'm saying that right, built, a, built an optical surgery center next door to his uh, uh, optician or op uh, ophthalmologist office in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. 
and he did that. Uh, well, he needs a certificate of need license mm. in order to you know go into business. But it's been languishing since 2004. What's that? 13 years. And uh, meanwhile, a nearby hospital, they were able to uh, get their license lickety split, uh, even though they started construction way after he did. What's going on? What is this certification? Certification of need. What is, what is that? It's basically. Um, the, the ability of an entrenched economic uh, group to uh, say yay or nay to their competitors. And if they don't like their competitor, they can deny them the certificate of need. Uh, Pacific Legal Foundation has been extraordinarily successful in challenging these laws throughout the country. And I'm surprised that we're not on the horn talking to Dr. Lee. This is actually an Institute of Justice case, if I'm not Oh, IJ. Well, that's yeah. why they beat us to it. Yeah. So, um, but it, it. We, we gave it to them. Did, did we? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we're probably too busy <laughs> winning Supreme Court kid. No, uh, back to uh, back to this. So it happens. Uh, it happens in in. Uh, and we wonder why medical care costs are so high. It's because competition is essentially banned. You can't get uh, put in a new surgery center unless your competitors say it's okay. Well, it's this a really government spons sponsored yeah. monopoly. Go ahead. Sorry. Just, just briefly, uh, the things we care about the most are the ones that are so heavily regulated, like healthcare. When we see the, when we allow the free market to work, is when we see the best quality and the cheapest. We're looking place. at an oligopoly in, in healthcare right now, a government enforced oligopoly, and we have high healthcare costs. And yet we have the Bernie heads saying we want single payer. So let's go from an oligopoly to a government monopoly. That'll work just fine, won't it? One minute left. Okay, Marquette County Road. In one minute, tell us the story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no pressure, Casey. <laughs> so here, uh, Pacific Legal Foundation is actually defending Marquette County and wanting to build a road that would make um, access easier for trucks to go to an existing site. It would decrease pollution, increase safety, and decrease uh, fuel. However, the EPA has EPA, disallowed. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, that's right, is against uh, decreased usage of fuel and stuff. It was surprising to me too, and they haven't given us. <laughs> wasn't surprising <laughs> to me. Well, no. I'm so that's it. You're, you're, so you're, essentially, there's a. Uh, they're trying to turn a 66 mile road into a 21 mile road, and uh, like I said. Tony wants to do it. Pollution. The, the uh, business wants to do it. The EPA State says wants no, to do it. Reason. That's the show. We'll see you again <laughs> next week, same time, same place on Libertarian Counterpoint on the web at www.wxsacramento.org, on YouTube, and uh,